Hello and welcome to part 2 of my Olivetti PCS286 video. So this is not going to be the same video as last time because last time we focused a lot on getting the power supply up and running again. But in this video we're going to be focusing on the computer itself. But before we do that, I do want to clarify one little continuity error that slipped into the last video. And that relates to this NPN power transistor that I pulled off an existing power supply. Now, I did end up ordering a new NPN power transistor, which is this one. So this is the BU508AW. And that is compatible with the existing heatsink which came with the power supply. So I decided to uh, use that one instead of the one that I pulled off the existing power supply. I also decided to change the X2 safety capacitor. So I ordered some brand new ones. Unfortunately, I don't have the time to uh, add them to this video. So you'll just have to take my word for it. And we'll start by taking a closer look at the main board of this PC. So let's get the screws off so that we can remove the main board from the case. Like so. Now like most branded PC, the non-clones, this main board is not AT compatible so you cannot fit it in another case. But let's take a look at the CPU here, which is an AMD 286 running at 12 megahertz with a little heatsink on it. Now we can add up to four SIM modules on this PC for some additional memory. There is 512 kilobytes of memory on the main board, as can be seen on the left with these NEC chips. And it has 512 kilobytes of additional RAM installed, bringing up the total to one megabyte of RAM. We also have an integrated floppy drive and hard drive controller and connectors. So this is provided by Western Digital. Here we see the two floppy drive controllers and here is the IDE connector for the hard drive. The infamous Dallas real-time clock chip is also present here, which will give us some trouble later on. The chipset is provided by Headland, which was a very popular chipset provider for 286 and 386 based systems. There are two BIOS chips installed, version 1.37, that we'll also take a look at later on. There is no separate PC speaker, but there is a speaker embedded on the main board here. Now the graphic capabilities are delivered by this Paradise VGA chip. And you can also see the video memory next to the chip, a full 256 kilobytes of video memory. As already stated, this PC has lots of integrated peripherals. So we get the parallel port, serial port. We obviously have the mouse and keyboard connectors and the embedded VGA connector. We also have the proprietary motherboard connector, which is not a standard AT style plug, but it does contain the same voltages. So we have the plus five volts, ground, plus 12 and minus 12 volts. Here we have the connector for the riser card, which gives us two 16-bit ISA slots and one 8-bit ISA slot. So it just goes in like that. But now we've got the power supply installed in the computer hooked up to the main board. So fingers crossed, let's flip the switch. We hear two beeps, that is good. So no explosions yet, which is excellent. And on the screen we get the CMOS timer error. So this is no doubt related to the Dallas chip, which is on the main board where the internal battery, which is contained uh, within this chip has gone dead. But other than that, the PC seems to be booting fine. BIOS revision 1.37, one megabytes of RAM, all the tests seems to pass. And here we enter the built-in setup menu where we see the flashing battery icon indicating that we need to do something about our CMOS battery. So this is kind of an icon-based CMOS setup. So it's actually text-based, but 
it uses the uh, ASCII character set uh, to display some uh, squares here so you can configure the date, the time, the hard drive, floppy drive, the video modes but let's go ahead and check the actual voltages that the power supply is delivering now and we get a clean 5.1 volts on the 5 volt rail which is excellent so let's go ahead and check the 12 volt rail and here we see 11.99 which is spot on I got myself one of those infrared thermometers and I noticed that there was one resistor in the power supply that is getting fairly hot. It is a 5 watt or a 10 watt resistor so I think that they can get really hot as a lot of current goes through them. But that's something that yeah I'll need to check. But yeah now that I have the IR thermometer I'm probably going to be paranoid about all kinds of heating issues in this power supply. Now the fan on the case is blowing air over the motherboard here. But I wanted to start looking at this Dallas chip. And as I flipped the board around and as I was editing this video, all of a sudden I noticed this. So is this a capacitor that just fell off the motherboard and landed on my desk? I have no idea. I haven't found it since, so Hopefully it won't be too big of a deal, but here we have the Dallas chip that we need to desolder. So these chips are infamous for going uh, bad because they have an internal battery in them. Battery goes dead and you need to replace the entire chip. So I'm going to be uh, yeah, desoldering the chip so you can use either this solder wick or a um, desolder pump. To free up all the through holes and then you can kind of wiggle it out using a flathead screwdriver and it should come off relatively easy so depending on how good your desoldering work was so mine wasn't really good it should come off fairly easy and here we have the dallas ds1287 real-time clock chip now before we are going to be uh, replacing it, I just want to check to see if all the holes have been freed up and there are a couple of them that need some additional work. So I'm going to be applying some extra solder here. And then using my desoldering pump, I am going to suck the solder away like so. And this should be sufficient to add our IC socket. So we're just going to look out for this cutout here, which should align with pin one of the Dallas chip. So this all depends on the orientation of the chip, but it goes in like so. And then we will add our Dallas chip afterwards. So we're just going to be soldering all of the pins here onto the main board. And then pick up our replacement Dallas chip. So this is not a new old stock chip. So this is uh, a brand new one actually. They still make them. You can order them uh, via uh, an, an electronics supplier like RS Components. And it just snaps right in and we should be good to go. And indeed with the next reboot the CMOS timer error disappears. The PC boots up just fine without the error message. It does boot up in the CMOS setup utility because obviously there are no CMOS settings at the moment. So I'm just going to enter a date, a time. I'm going to try and configure the hard drive, which is a 20 megabyte hard drive. So you only get to choose between 20 megabytes and 40 megabytes. I'm going to add the floppy disk unit. But here we get an error on the fixed disk and it is not able to find our floppy disk and we get the system configuration error. And it took me a while to find out what exactly the issue was here because I was pretty sure that the hard drive and the floppy drive would work. So I checked the cables and the power supply and everything was fine. But the thing is that in order for the hard drive and the floppy drive to work, you need to add this riser card to the main board. Otherwise, it will not be able to find the floppy drive and the hard drive. So with the riser card installed, let's boot the system once more. 
And as you can see, I forgot to set the video mode to 80 columns, so we'll fix that later. But now, more importantly, it has found the fixed disk and the floppy disk. It does prompt me to select the floppy drive unit once more. But now it should be able to boot straight off the hard drive. So it found the fixed disk, it found the floppy disks. I am still getting a system configuration error. So it is booting into MS-DOS from the hard drive. So let's do a quick reboot and see what that system configuration error might be. So it's again prompting me to select the floppy disk and the video mode. So I'm going to put the video mode now to 80 by 25 internal. Do a reboot and see what she does. So now it's starting in 80 column mode, which already looks a lot better. We have the fixed disk, the floppy disk. We don't have any errors anymore and it's booting from the hard drive. And what's cool about this setup utility is that you can enter it from the MS-DOS prompt using shift Control alt delete and it will pop up the CMOS setup utility screen where you can select the time, the date. There are two different hard drive types to choose from, 20 megabyte and 40 megabyte. You can select the floppy disk type, in our case 1.44 megabytes. There are a couple of different video modes that you can select, 40 columns, 80 columns, monochrome, both internal and external displays. You can select the RAM speed test. You can select the uh, CPU frequency, both the RAM and I.O the keyboard type Matic rate and you can also specify a password for this setup utility and you can also change the language so I'm guessing Italian will be one of them so we have Italian, Dutch, French, German, English so yeah that's pretty much it when it comes to the CMOS setup utility but the PC seems to be working fine now. It finds both the fixed disk and the floppy disk. Everything seems to work, so I'm pretty happy with that. So the computer comes with 512 kilobytes of RAM on the main board, but as I already showed you, there are two SIM modules installed with 256 kilobyte each. Now, if you start the computer without these SIM modules installed, besides the fact that you will only have 512 kilobytes of RAM, you will also get this memory error, and that's because the PC still thinks it has one megabyte of memory. Therefore, it will prompt you to select 512 kilobytes of RAM in the CMOS setup utility, after which the PC will start just fine. And when you add the 512 kilobytes of RAM using these SIM modules, the computer will automatically detect them. It will report a total memory of one megabyte. It will not throw an error, but you will be prompted to configure that one megabyte of RAM in the CMOS setup. Now I seem to recall somebody in the previous video mentioning that these Connor hard drives are built like tanks and this one is no exception. So I really like these Connor hard drives because they really remind me on you know, the type of hard drives that were in these old computers. And this one was running perfectly as well. It had MS-DOS version 5 installed in German, but it had no bad sectors. It was running absolutely flawlessly. But now the time has come to put everything back together again. So I, I had already screwed in the motherboard onto the case. So now it's just a matter of screwing in these screws here for the I.O. ports. Adding this protective uh, casing here on the mains input. 
the power supply cover back on so it uses this little standoff on the power supply to screw the casing back in place the computer also came with this what i think is an rf shielding that you put in place here by sliding it in on the top of the case and then we can attach the rear panel here that goes over the various I.O. ports it screws into place using two screws and then all that's left to do is to slide on over the main case cover so I'm gonna place the unit like this and then it just just slide right on over and you secure it using a couple of screws so that's pretty much it we have the unit completely assembled again. It seems to be working fine. I don't have the original monitor or keyboard, unfortunately, but yeah, I think this old IBM monitor and Model M keyboard goes just fine with it. And I hope you've enjoyed this little quick tour of the Olivetti PCS286 computer. Again, as always, if you like this kind of content, please consider subscribing to the channel, checking out the other videos, hitting the like buttons, and commenting on the videos. And I hope to see you guys soon. Bye-bye.